Welcome to episode number 11 in the Therapeutic Parenting Podcast from COECT, the Centre of Excellence in Child Trauma. I'm Serena Gay, your host, and today we'll be talking to our founder and CEO, Sarah Nash, again as we wrap up series one with the last episode of the season. Sarah will explain what we mean by therapeutic parenting in fostering. In other words, how does it differ from standard fostering? In case you need reminding, the organisation Sarah founded, COECT, is an umbrella organisation combining resources, research and knowledge from experts such as its Inspire Training Group and the National Association of Therapeutic Parents. We provide parents of traumatised children and supporting professionals with effective strategies to deal with the challenges in their lives and to achieve the best possible outcomes. Sarah is widely recognised as a trailblazer in the field of therapeutic parenting and is a best-selling author. She has direct experience of therapeutic parenting, having adopted and raised to adulthood five siblings who suffered profound trauma in their early years. She founded both Inspire Training Group and the National Association of Therapeutic Parents, the NATP. She's also been the keynote speaker at conferences around the world and is the UK's best-selling author on therapeutic parenting. Sarah is a co-owner and founder of the True Fostering Agency and most recently, in October 2020, she founded Safer Fostering in Wales, the first not-for-profit therapeutic parenting fostering agency in the UK. So hello again, Sarah, and it's good to have you back on the podcast. Hi, Serena. Great to be here. So let's start off by asking you to help us understand the difference between therapeutic parenting, fostering and standard fostering. I think that there's a lot of misconception about therapeutic parenting and fostering and people talk about therapeutic fostering as well. So the main difference is in therapeutic parenting and fostering, we use the TRUE model, which stands for therapeutic reparenting underpinned by empathy. And that means that we have therapeutic parenting running right through the core of everything we do. So it starts when we assess foster parents, it uh, is reflected in the way that we support foster parents and also in our terminology. So for example, we refer to people who foster as therapeutic foster parents and never foster carers. So there's quite a lot of differences in language. We don't use, for example, the word placement to describe a child, which is very common in standard fostering. It's very common to hear people say, oh, I've had 12 placements. And what they mean is I've looked after 12 children. So I think some of the big differences are around the types of support support that are given and that means that there's different outcomes so children stay put a lot longer and foster parents tend to stay put too they don't resign they don't give up. So how would you characterise standard fostering then? I think that standard fostering is a bit of a misnomer really because really all children who've suffered developmental trauma need to be therapeutically reparented Unfortunately, there are some people who haven't really got with that yet and they're still under the impression that you can really take a child from a very traumatic situation, place them with foster carers and everything will be okay. The problem is, is that, okay, the child might be safe and they might be getting their physical needs met. But what the child needs on top of that, crucially, is they need their emotional needs met at a level which therapeutic parenting succeeds at. So children who suffer developmental trauma, we know that there are often changes within the brain and a therapeutic foster parent will help the child to build synapses in the brain to help link cause and effect, to help to stop them being impulsive and to help them to achieve better outcomes. And it's this real strategic difference which makes a big, big difference to children and to the families as well. So a standard, somebody who's doing standard fostering, for example, might not have training in therapeutic parenting. They might not understand. So they might be using outdated methods, for example. They might be trained to believe or feel that 
using something like the naughty step or reward charts or time out is a good effective behavior management strategy for children from developmental trauma but actually we know that all those kinds of strategies not only do they not work but they can actually cause a fracture in the relationship and it means that the child's more likely to move. So you would argue then that all foster parents effectively need to apply therapeutic parenting techniques and so it should be the standard really? Yes that's right it should be the standard throughout all fostering agencies and local authorities because if you're using therapeutic parenting techniques you are definitely giving the child a much better chance of recovery. No children come in through the care system in the UK where you know nothing has happened. It's very difficult these days for a child to actually be taken into care. There has to be quite a high threshold met. So the child will have suffered some kind of harm or trauma or something quite difficult and significant would have happened in their life. Well, our children need skilled professionals and by that I mean skilled therapeutic foster parents supported by social workers who are knowledgeable to overcome their trauma. So there's the only way that a child could come into a foster home and not have suffered any trauma is if they literally decide one day perhaps they fancy going to stay with some foster parents and pop along to social services to ask if they can have a little stay. That doesn't happen. <laughs> there's also sometimes I see adverts where you know people will advertise and say could you look after this child you know the parents were killed in a car crash last night i have to say in 30 years of social work and working in fostering adoption that's never happened so generally what we see and what we know the families that are needed by children are children are where the child has experienced trauma from wherever they were living before so how how widespread then is understanding of therapeutic parenting techniques throughout the country, would you say? It's interesting because I'm just going back to when I was looking after my children. So let's say when they were all sort of teenagers, so about 10 to 15 years ago, at that point, there was just the beginnings of some quite significant writing beginning to happen, which really backed up what I was already doing. I'd already learnt that standard techniques didn't work with my children and with children that I'd been involved with previously as a social worker. So when I founded Inspire Training Group, we, I would say about seven or eight years ago, we absolutely voices in the wilderness. There was not really anybody else out there providing training. And the concept of therapeutic parenting was met with a degree of suspicion, really. I'm glad to say that even in the last eight years, we've made very big inroads into that. And now with the diploma we run in therapeutic parenting, with our publications, we have seen quite a big shift. So now it's not unusual for us to, for example, see on our Facebook page that other people are giving the advice that we would have given eight years ago. So now I feel like the balance is changing and I can be confident if I'm sent off to go and work with a fostering agency, or adoption agency, a local authority, there's a chance that some of them will have heard of therapeutic parenting and that they are using those techniques. I have to say, generally speaking, it's patchy. There are some local authorities that absolutely still have their head in the sand, are still working with reward charts and outdated methods and wondering why they have very high levels of what they would call placement breakdown, what we would call family breakdown. And then there are others, usually quite small independent fostering agencies who've really embraced therapeutic parenting. They've upskilled their social workers and they are using all the techniques and those are the places where you see the biggest um, benefits to the children and the families really. So how would you advise local authorities to set about updating their practices? 
Well, first of all, it can help them just by reading some of the publications that we've got. That gives them a good introduction. We have recently released the Complete Professional Guide to Therapeutic Parenting. And also, quite significantly, in August this year, we've got a book coming out which is written by myself, Sarah Dillon and Jane Mitchell. And that is aimed at supporting professionals like social workers and it gives them practical tools to implement therapeutic parenting within their teams and within their agencies. Now, I feel that this will be quite a game changer, really, because I think that when I do a lot of training with social workers, sometimes I feel like they are worried that it's going to be very complicated or very difficult to make that change. But by giving them the practical tools that they need to put in the changes and by breaking it down and explaining it in very simple terms, they can see how they can make those changes step by step. So we're actually providing templates for them to do that. The main thing that social workers need to do is read up on therapeutic parenting and crucially read up on developmental trauma and why children behave the way they do when they suffered developmental trauma and that changes their approach altogether. What we see all too often within all the places that we go to train, I, th I would say they fall into four different categories. You've got you know, at the top or at the bottom, I should say, really, the local authorities and agencies who have no intention of changing, who cling desperately to the wreckage of the outdated ship that they once sailed and hope that everything will be OK, whilst they keep telling everybody to keep using reward charts and time out and literally have their fingers stuck in their ears. Those are the ones that tend to do the, the worst with outcomes for children. Then you've got the next ones up who aren't really buying into it, but know that there's a bit of a buzz about with the word therapeutic. So they might do something like have a therapist in once a month and then say they're therapeutic or say that they, you know, they get it. And those are the people we struggle with a fair bit because often the managers and social workers will feel that they understand quite a lot. But then when we're doing the training with the foster parents, they're saying, they don't get it. So we have bridges to build there to get everybody on the same page. It's nine times out of 10, the foster parents have read up about therapeutic parenting and they know their stuff. The next ones up, I would say, are the ones who really do want to get therapeutic parenting. They've, they've read the documentation, they've read the publications, they've embraced the training and they're on their way. They're on their way to doing it. And you can really see the difference in those agencies and those teams because there's more cohesiveness between the social workers and the foster parents. And you will also have more support staff around as well. So, for example, if I was going into one of those sorts of agencies to do training, I would 100 percent expect to see the staff coming in for the same training as the foster parents with the open acknowledgement that everyone needs to learn this. In the less skilled agencies, you see a bit of a them and us attitude and there's a feeling that the social workers are the experts and they know everything and it's only the foster parents who need the training. But actually, the reverse is normally true. The top level is really the, the agencies that are very, very small, hardly any about in the UK at the moment, but they are using the true model of therapeutic parenting. They have a whole team around the foster parent. They have empathic listeners. They have their social workers very well supported and trained uh, with additional training in child trauma and therapeutic parenting. And they have children support workers as well. And they'd also have what we call reflect groups or TP groups going on, which is run by a, a specialist therapist who understands trauma and can give practical advice and strategies. So those agencies stand out because children stay put for years if the plan is for them to stay long term in fostering they stay put for years and the foster parents are generally very happy and get a lot of job satisfaction so how would you characterize the differences between how safer fostering and true fostering operate in comparison with other kinds of agencies other kinds of fostering agencies one of the key and critical differences is right from the get-go in the way we assess 
foster parents, therapeutic foster parents. Most agencies and local authorities will use pretty outdated methods of assessment. They're very hard work. They tend to look in great detail at things that really aren't very important. We tend to use our own therapeutic fostering assessment. And what that measures is really the resilience of the foster parent and we put a structure in place during the assessment looking in detail about how these foster parents will be supported. In the old outdated ways of um, assessing foster parents, there's a what social workers tend to do is they look at the existing support structure. Well, we know that that support structure often crumbles and fails when people start fostering. And that's because generally people do not understand the pressures on the family and what happens with behaviours with children from developmental trauma. By assessing foster parents differently, we can make sure that that structure is in place and we train the supporters alongside the foster parents. So that's one of the, so it starts differently right from the beginning. We also put in place, rather than putting in training that's a bit meaningless, we map all our training into therapeutic parenting. So as our foster parents go through the normal course of training events that they need to know to look after children, they automatically get a level two qualification in therapeutic parenting with very little effort from them. I mean, they've obviously got, they've got to learn this stuff anyway, so they may as well get a qualification to reflect what they actually do know. The other thing that I think people notice very differently is that support structure. So we have, of course, supervising social workers because they have to do all the statutory work and they're trained up to a level where they are able to really strategize with the foster parent and give them meaningful support. But all our foster parents also have the empathic listener that they can phone up and they can just offload to. And we have children support workers who do practical stuff to help free up our foster parents. So, for example, they might go in in the evenings to babysit. They might go in to take the child to visit their birth family if that's what needs to happen. Or they offer quite a high level of practical support to the family, which is often uh, very needed. And all those people work closely together with the therapist to make sure that that family feels able to say I've had a terrible time I'm not coping well so we can get in there at an early point and help them to exit feeling that way. If, if parents are interested in fostering children you know the therapeutic parenting way can they go straight to your agency or do they have to go through the social services first? They, if they want to foster a child and they've never fostered before, it's completely fine for them to come straight to one of the agencies, therapeutic agencies. They can go there straight away and they would then have what I've just described, the therapeutic parenting fostering assessment. The children who then are placed with them would come probably from their local authority, but they can sometimes come from outside the area. So that's that's generally how people tend to approach us. Sometimes we are approached by other foster parents who might be fostering for other agencies and perhaps they're feeling unsupported or maybe they really want to do therapeutic parenting and they feel that their agency doesn't get it or isn't promoting that. So frequently I would say we are approached by foster parents who might have been fostering for some time and just say we want to be surrounded by people who actually are on the same page as us. So we do have people transfer in and we have new people who've never fostered before as well that have approached us. So I think it would be interesting to drill down into the key issues that foster parents of traumatised children have to deal with and, and, and what your agencies do to help them. I'm thinking of things like, you know, compassion fatigue, and I'm sure there are other aspects too that you could discuss with us. Why don't we start off with with the issue of compassion fatigue? How How do you respond to that as an agency? It's interesting because the whole reason why the true model exists and our model of support exists is because of compassion fatigue. So, Many years ago, when my children were young, you know, I, I felt very, very isolated and I really was struggling. And when I went to look into why this was and why I felt so alone and, you know, 
when I reached out for help, it simply wasn't there. So, so I made it my business really to, to do a lot of work around that. And that's how we ended up doing our very first lot of research at Bristol University into compassion fatigue in foster care. And what we found there was that many foster carers feel completely beaten by the system, not so much the children, but they just feel like, you know, they're often blamed and judged and isolated. And that is a cause of compassion fatigue and that can make them give up on a child. It can make them feel like it's just too difficult. So what we did is we did a, a, a real change of attitude with everything. And within the agency, we looked at that and we thought, well, we know and we found that one of the best ways of helping a foster parent to stay out of compassion fatigue is make sure that they have somebody that they can talk to who really understands what they are going through. So we make sure that our empathic listeners are other therapeutic parents. They might be adopters, they might be experienced foster parents, but they will have walked a mile in their shoes. Unfortunately, I think some less skilled agencies or local authorities think it's enough to just kind of offer strategies, but that's not what foster parents need or want. What they need is for somebody to understand where they're coming from. And nine times out of 10, if they're listened to, they can work out what to do themselves actually. But it's that being listened to in the first place that reduces the compassion fatigue. It's such a simple thing to do, but it's something that is missed time and time again by agencies and local authorities and they just go straight into problem solving and it doesn't help anybody. So we we really help alleviate the effects of compassion fatigue by making sure we have the empathic listener. Of course, as well, all our foster parents are members of the NATP and can also attend listening circles. So they've got another place to go to as well. What about the issue of false allegations that, you know, happen all too often? Can you talk us around the whole issue there? Yes, I would say that is the main reason why we have people wanting to transfer to us. So in um, the COECT, we've done quite a lot of work and research around false allegations. And it was the subject of, of one of our conferences, I think, in 2019. Now, we understand that children mix up what's happened with what's happening. And sometimes when they make an allegation, you know, that allegation is untrue or it happened at a different time. But there's an awful lot of people out there who still don't get that. And they treat every allegation a child makes as if it were true. Now, this causes, as you can imagine, real heartache and some terrible things have happened to foster parents as a result. So, for example, children might be moved without really looking into what's happening as a knee jerk reaction. And then it can take so long to look into what's actually happened that by then the child doesn't come back. Now, that's devastating for the child and the family. So. Often, because of the different way that we handle allegations, we do a lot of training with um, staff and with foster parents as well around where uh, allegations come from and how we have to manage them. And if ever we get an allegation that comes up, we've usually anticipated it and that makes a massive difference. So, for example, when a child comes into our agency, we do what's called a trauma tracker. And the trauma tracker looks at the potential places where an allegation might arise. So if an allegation then happens, we can say, ah, oh, the trigger for that is this. Look, this happened in the child's past and we've got that to fall back on already. This tool, the trauma tracker I'm talking about, is one of the tools I mentioned earlier, which is in our new book coming out in August. And I believe that's going to be called the A to Z uh, Companion Edition for Professionals. I believe that's what the title of it will be. So the trauma tracker is in that. And what that does, it looks at the child's history. So, for example, if you have a child who uh, was removed on their birthday, say they were, it was their birthday, something traumatic happened on their birthday, and then they were removed and taken into care, we know that that date... As the birthday approaches, it's likely that something could happen. So there would be a note within the trauma tracker that this is a key date, this is a flashpoint date. It might be that there's an incident that's happened moving up to that time. So, for example, uh, if we think about a child who uh, last saw their birth mum, perhaps in very difficult circumstances, 
having re-established uh, visitation with mum might then provoke some of those memories and they might come up. So that's the kind of thing that we'd be flagging up early, i.e., look, this date, the child's birthday, a week before their birthday, this happened and the child was taken into care. So be aware that the child might be reliving some of that at this point. So we might, for example, even put in some examples of what was happening during that week, because that's the kind of thing the child might well be talking about. We believe in prevention, not cure. We, we do proactive, not reactive, and that can save an awful lot of heartache. I have literally, sadly, lost count of the number of foster parents that we've worked with through NATP who have been through this horrendous experience and, you know, over over 85 percent of the time, those allegations are completely unfounded. But yet the foster parents often give up fostering because it's such a traumatic experience for them. This is this is the, the, the kind of attention that falls into the wraparound support that you provide. What other kinds of support fall into this particular category? I think the the other thing that we do is the what I what I've called the BET, which is the behavioural assessment of impact and resolution tool. This that's also in the 